how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Written in 1773 by John Newton and William Cowper, this legendary hymn was destined to have an impact on millions around the world. None more dramatically than Mike and Astor Mullins, who just happened to live in the same village where the song was conceived. And one of my favorite songs has always been the hymn Amazing Grace. In fact, from the moment of my own conversion, I used to sign everything Amazed by Grace. In 2009, Andrew was born on the 26th of September. It was a good pregnancy, it was a good birth, everything was fine. And it was another boy I had now at this point. I had four boys and one girl. My little Andrew was my victory baby. I thought victory over my fear, victory over my own self. In 2010, by Christmas time, Andrew was, um, he was behaving sort of funny. Uh, he wasn't eating so well, he was losing a bit of weight and he was hitting his head a lot. And, and like he was our fifth child, so we've seen teething, we've seen problems like that before, but this was ongoing then with him and seemed to be getting worse. And so I went to the doctor. He had two ear infections. Oh, I thought that explains the two ear infections. No wonder he's in pain. So he got antibiotics for that. We went to Holland the next day for Christmas holiday. After two nights there, that morning I woke up, I said, that's it, it is outrageous, this is abnormal. So we went to the doctor through the snow. And we had doctors look at him over there and kept him in for almost a full day in hospital. They couldn't find anything wrong with him. And then we came home. And now I was also pregnant at that time. Because there was a little bit of an age gap, we said, poor little Andrew, you know, I want him to have a little sibling, so we planned the sixth one quite close to it, and also with my age. And then in, in January, he was on the bed, and I saw a little lump on his back, and I remember that cold feeling as if a cold hand gripped my heart. We didn't know what that was, so we went to our doctor, and he said, well, bring him, you know, to get scanned. The consultants, they, they looked at him and that, and... They arranged the scan, but not until March, and they didn't think it was really anything to be overly concerned about. I think I was relieved that they didn't think it was more serious than that. So I went home and it escalated. He got in so much pain, he was screaming and crying, and it was just horrible, it got very aggressive. We went back to our doctor and the doctor looked, and he asked that uh, anything come of the scan results, and we said, uh, they, they haven't scanned him yet. He's going to get scanned in March. He said, today. This child needs to be scanned today. I need to find out what this is. This is serious. So I packed my bags because I thought they're going to observe him overnight. So of course I phoned my parents. That is Monday. I phoned them saying we're going into hospital to be checked. On Tuesday I'm phoning. Listen, we're going to stay for another night. And they said, don't do anything else with this child. Get him over here straight away. Wednesday I'm phoning. I'm saying they're sending me to the children's hospital in Dublin. I said to my mom, I said, get your immigration papers ready. I need you. And on the 25th of February 2011, our 17 month old little baby boy was diagnosed with stage four neuroblastoma cancer. When she said uh, stage four, we asked naively, how many stages are there? And she said, this is the final stage. And when they told us, you know, he had cancer and that he had 30% chance, that felt like a death sentence. He had cancer also in every bone in his body, uh, except his hands and his feet. Andrew also had a tumor measuring seven by eight by 21 centimeters in his little 17 month old body. I honestly, at that point, I thought I'd lost him, you know, and that I had only a few more months with him. I remember the day so well when we uh, carried him down to oncology. I didn't even know that the word oncology meant a cancer ward, you know, it, it just, we're going and thinking, how did I end up here? You just look around and you see children who are suffering the effects of this evil disease, seeing parents who are angry and blaming God and despairing. And you wonder, okay, God, have you allowed this? Did you put us here for a reason? What, what can I do? What's going on? So straight away when we're in there, of course, the consultant talks to us. She's explaining this protocol that he's going to go on a trial. We have to sign for this, that. And I remember just before we finished, I said to the consultant, um, would you mind if we pray? 
And she said, sure, that's okay. And I said, I would like to pray for you because you're going to be looking after my kids, so I want to pray for you. And we all bowed our heads and we, we prayed. And coming with my heart as an evangelist to share the gospel, which I thought was just about the forgiveness of sins with people, I thought, how can I share with people here? Because they have one desire and that's to be healed. And I remember there was a dad I was talking to in a small kitchenette in the hospital. And uh, we were just some small talk, a cup of tea. And uh, as I was talking to him, he said, uh, so what do you do for a living? And I said, I work with a Christian charity. And he said, do you mind me asking, how can you believe in a loving God who would allow this to happen to small children? At that time, what I said to him was, you know, I believe that uh, God's in control of everything. He has a purpose and a plan in this, and I don't know what it is, but I trust him. Because, you know, that was the answer I thought you have to give. Deep down in my heart, I'm very confused. I came away and I thought, God, what do I say? What do I say? I don't, this isn't a place to talk about heaven and hell or to talk about the law. Or are you a good person? Do you know that, that Christ has paid for your sin? It was a place where people needed to know that there's a healer and, and that they could be healed. You've heard so many doctrinal things and, you've, and everybody encourages you. Of course, you have many people then coming and calling you, writing to you, and we had people saying to us, well, God needs another little angel in heaven. Well, the Lord is in, in control. The Lord knows what He is doing. The Lord has a plan. We had someone actually say that because of all our years in ministry, that God actually counted us worthy now to have a child with cancer. And so many people around us were giving up hope and we're almost counting him for dead and telling us, many people actually told us, just let him go, you need to let him go. I said, I'm not ready to let my son go. I'm not ready to let my little boy go. And so as a father and as, as Astor's as a wife, as parents, we wanted to do everything we could for him to live. We also then thought, okay, well, here we go on this journey. The right thing to do, what we need to do, is to mobilize as many people to pray for Andrew. So Mike started a Facebook page. I'm not really into computers and all of that, but he loves that. We even called it Pray for, the number four, Andrew, Pray for Andrew. And very quickly we gathered thousands of followers. People were liking this page and following. And we were giving updates and pictures and asking and begging people, please pray for Andrew, pray for this, pray for that. Because I thought, well, that's what we have to do. We have to beg and plead with God. About two or three months later, I started to freak out. And we thought, what is going on? With Andrew's Facebook page, we had, you know, 4,000 people or whatever following him. But we honestly thought at one stage, would God listen if we got 10,000? I mean, does God have a quota that he's looking for? I said, can I miss a miracle? No. They said, you can never miss a miracle. No, it's all set in stone, you know, like God has, knows already what's happening. You don't die one day earlier than God has ordained. He already knows the outcome, it's already totally set in stone. All those things, at the end of the day, you start to think, why actually are we praying? What? What is the point of all of this? This is after five months of treatment. There are tens of thousands of people praying all over the world. Yes, in spite of all the people praying, the progress seemed to be very slow. I remember one stage, I went to um, a prayer meeting myself. Uh, I came in and I said, oh, Mike's here. Mike, how would you like us to pray for, for Andrew? And I said, pray for him as if he's your own son. And with that, we started praying. And people were crying and begging and shouting and pleading with God. But I came away from that meeting and I thought to myself, is that it? I mean, do I have to wake God up? Do I have to beg him to have mercy on my child? Do I, as a human being, have more compassion than God does? And uh, that really got me thinking. And so then myself and my wife began to pray differently. Our prayer, I think, really changed to God. Please teach us how to pray. When our sixth child was born, it was a girl, and I went in labor in the cancer ward. There was no question about it. Of course, she was going to be grace. And also, we were in the middle of the cancer and everything at that time, and it was just a perfect name. So, I'm in the bed with the baby, and the post is coming in every day. Parcels for Andrew, parcels for Grace, you know, baby clothes, you know, little pyjamas, prayer blankets. 
And in the midst of all of that, there was a letter with CDs. And there were four CDs in it. And they had handwritten on the, on the CD cover, God wants you well. Now that title, funny enough, really didn't do it for me at all. At the time, I was so raw. I thought, yeah, right, what do I have to do for that, you know? We just put it on the shelf and we thought, okay, I don't know what that's about. And I just hit rock bottom. But I thought, how do you give up Jesus? How do you do that? He's real to me. I honestly, I couldn't read my Bible. Literally, I just hadn't got the time. I was too exhausted. Um, I couldn't pray. I was just really just in survival mode. I went to a friend of mine. Uh, he's a pastor friend and I said, um, I'm really in survival mode here. I really need help. Uh, and he said, you know, it's okay to be in survival mode. And I said, I don't want to be in survival mode. I want to be in more than a conqueror mode. I want to know what the Bible has to say about healing, what God has to say about healing. Because if it's for today, then I'm missing it. And I want to know how it works and what I need to do, because his life depends on it. But nothing was happening. We, we got this CD and one time as we were going to Dublin, I mean, we were just so low and we listened to it in the car. And the message, God wants you well, was from a, a guy called Andrew Womack. And as we listened to this message, driving to Crumlin Hospital in Dublin for the next round of chemotherapy, something resonated in a message he was speaking. And you think, wow, water to my parched, parched, dried out soul. It resonated with our hearts. And though we had never heard this before, it was as if we had. We listened to all four of them. Then I listened to all of them again. And I thought, I actually always knew this. And in fact, my wife kept, uh, kept a diary, a journal, and she wrote in her diary or journal that night, could it be true? And that, that just got us onto this whole journey of exploring and understanding God's will. And it is to heal, always to heal. Once I started listening to that and became convinced that God wants you well, because that was my question the whole time, what was God's will that he was going to live or was God's will for him to die? I seriously believed that it could possibly be God's will for him to die and I couldn't understand it. How could God ordain a child that is a victory child then to die at age two? I just couldn't get my head around it. But it was until I listened to the teaching I thought, no, God always wants you well. This is just simply an attack of Satan. We were listening on the website on the MP3 player and it was just feeding us as we were in the hospital with Andrew. So with him asleep with his head on my hand, I would be listening to the messages of Andrew Warmack and it was building me up. It was encouraging me. I, I'd written down Bible verses about bones because his bones were so badly infected. It's nothing to do with our feelings. It's not even what Andrew Womack says. It's what the Word of God says. And he was clearly pointing us to the Word of God. We found promises in the Word of God in Proverbs where it says good news makes your bones healthy. It's good for your bones. But once I got it that God always wants to heal and that by His stripes we were healed, that it was already paid for, that it was part of salvation. And I believed that. I looked at that Bible verse again. If this is the Word of God, then this is truth. This is the truth. And this is my answer. And there's no other good news than the gospel. The gospel is the good news. And part of the gospel is that by his stripes you are healed. We said, well, there's a problem with Andrew's bones. And the good news is not just positive thinking. It is the gospel. It is the good news of Jesus Christ, we believe. And so we never did this before. But we just got Andrew. We put our hands in him because the Bible says in Mark 16 that these signs will follow those who believe. You will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So we put our hands on his thigh bones and his pelvis and we said, Bones, we've got good news for you. By his stripes you were healed. And in faith, with a total conviction in my heart, we spoke that Bible first, standing on the Word of God. And I was so excited. We didn't see anything happen with Andrew. He was just playing. Well, he got, of course, tested and we got a phone call from the consultant, very excited. She said, I don't know how to tell you this, but everything regarding Andrew is up in the air. We said, is it up in the air good or up in the air bad? She said, it's up in the air good. Every one of Andrew's bones are completely clean of cancer. I said, well, that's wonderful. I said, yeah, why is everything up in the air? She said, we, we totally didn't expect this. This is totally unexpected. I was not even surprised. I thought, yeah, I was expecting that. I knew his bones were going to be clean. We had learned how to pray with authority, and it worked. 
everything was speeded up. You know, a couple of weeks later we heard that his bones were clear. Two weeks later we're going into transplant. He was going to get a stem cell infusion. So uh, my sister from Australia came over for that. We were a team of three people. And we downloaded all the material from the website, you know, the free audio material. And day and night, you know, we were listening. And again, we had many people saying to us, well, if you really believe God wants to heal him and take him off, I said, I'm, I'm not ready to do that. And God is gracious. He still had a little bit of tumor left in his spine of active cancer because they couldn't take it out because of the place where it was at. So we're going into transplant and I said to the Lord, Lord, I'm finished fighting with the, the scripture on the bones. I need something else. I need another weapon. In Judges 3, and it said here, now Ehud made himself a dagger. It was double-edged and a cubit in length, and he fastened it under his clothes on his right thigh. He goes to Ehud. It says Ehud was a very fat man. And I suddenly, I thought, this is a picture. An ugly cancer sitting there on top of my little son, you know? And Ehud said, I've got a message from God for you. And he thrust that dagger into the king's belly. And I thought, that's it. We laid hands then on, on Andrew, on his belly, because the cancer was in his spine. And we said, cancer, neuroblastoma, I've got a message from God for you. By his stripes, Andrew was healed. And I left that word of God sitting there because Ehud did not pull his dagger out. He left it sitting in there. At the end of treatment, they will do reassessments and they will check him out and they will find out that that Lord is laying dead on the floor. A neuroblastoma is a very dangerous cancer that hides in the body, that can very easily come back. And I thought, I'm not impressive, it's not me, but I'm coming against cancer with the word of God. And that is going to kill that cancer because nothing can stand, you know, for that. It's a double-edged sword, sharper than anything. It's, it's a very tough course of treatment. When we went into the transplant and knowing what the word of God can do, we looked where Jesus says to his disciples, and these signs shall follow those who believe. They will take up serpents and they will drink anything deadly and it will by no means hurt them. <clears throat> and they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. I said, Lord, I'm seeing this in your word and I'm taking that. And I asked God to charge his, put angels charge over his body, over his kidneys, over his liver, over his testicles, over any part that could be damaged by this poison. And when he was tested... That Andrew's kidneys, liver, heart, eyesight, hearing is all perfect. And concerning his fertility, I think that will be fine. That will be fine. And I look forward, you know, to the children that he will have. And when he has children, of such a cry for victory, you know. But I know it will be done because I'm standing on the word of God. If you put your faith on this, you're not hoping for something. You're not hoping, oh yeah, it will be all right. No, you're, you're standing on something so solid that is unshakable and unmovable, and you're standing on the Word of God, and you put your faith on that, and that is when the victory, where the victory is, where, where the stability is, where the foundation is. I think one of the cool things in this is just um, where I think where we were in our faith, it's as if we had tried everything. But then it was like this voice from heaven saying, take your net and put it over on the other side. Because there are many people saying to us, you, you can't do that, you, you don't fish there, you don't do that. And uh, it was a big step in faith for us to do. When we saw his bones healed, um, we got very, very excited about this. And, you know, it's not a popular thing. I had people saying to me, listen, don't talk about healing. You cannot say that God always wants to heal. And if you just keep your mouth shut, don't talk about healing, everything will be fine. But I said, i got to let you into a wee secret. When I get excited about something, I can't keep quiet. I can't shut up. And what we realized in our own hearts was, especially when we listened to the teaching of Andrew Womack, was that we actually had faith and unbelief at the same time. And when we came to that realization, that was a whole revelation to us. Then we began to rebuke that, that unbelief and work to get rid of it and build our faith and confidence and trust in God. And that was a huge thing for us. And all of a sudden we were getting such a great catch. Not only did we see Andrew here, but we saw others too. And so it was just so exciting to see the Word of God work. So to get through all of that, and then of course we had the reassessment. 
That was the 18th of October 2012. We were in the car park in the supermarket. We got a phone call from our consultant. Andrew's cancer free. And it was sort of a numbing feeling because I put it on speakerphone. We both listened. We said, oh, this is wonderful. Thank you so much. And then we hung up and we kind of just pulled in and we, we looked at each other. And we weren't jumping up and down and all ecstatic. And I think the reason for that is because we already knew. A year ago we knew he was, he was healed. Mike posted it on Facebook and, uh, you know, the 5,000 people that have been following. But we got that day the, the, the little thing of like, you know, the numbers went up, 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 up. Every time you refreshed it went up, 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 went up to around 24,000. I thought the whole world, all over the world, all over the globe, there are people and there's churches sharing and shouting and rejoicing. This whole thing is about God's amazing grace. When I had that revelation of grace, then I couldn't shut up about it. And it was the same feeling as I had when I was born again. And that's radically changed our lives. It's brought a freshness and newness and a great excitement and a great confidence in, in the love of God and the goodness of God and open doors to share with people. I have no problem going to people and sharing Jesus. Right now, I'm in a place where if I see someone who's sick, whereas before I would have run away and avoided, right now I just go to them and say, I have great news for you. I want to tell you something you may not have heard before. God is good, He loves you and He wants you to be healed. And it really is because of all that we've learned on this journey with Andrew and also through the teaching of Andrew Womack. At the same time, I wouldn't say that God put us in that situation with Andrew to learn that lesson, but it was through what we went through with Andrew that we realized that God was there with us through it. And when we called out to him, he was right there for us to help us. But certainly he didn't make him sick or even allow, permit or want it in his life. He is full of life. He's such a zest for life, you know, he loves life. And uh, yeah, it's really, it's fantastic to see him. Very active, very playful. Yeah, very happy. Again, we're so thankful for the doctors and the nurses and the wonderful job that they do, but our faith is not in, in them or the medication. Our faith was firmly rooted in God and His love and His finished work and in His Word. And we are so thankful. And that's why we want to share this with others. We want to tell others, God is good. He's gooder than you think. <laughs>